Welcome to the 37th eBay Tech Talk. Today uh, we have Monica Sabu from Elastic talking on uh, monitoring your containers with the Elastic Stack. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Sarbu and today I'll talk about how you can monitor your containers with the Elastic Stack. A bit about myself. So uh, I'm working for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Kibana, Logstash. Um, and Elasticsearch. I don't know. Uh, I'm team lead in the Bits team uh, and today we're going to talk about how you can monitor your containers. So when, when, you, when you want to start monitoring your containers, probably the first thing you want to do is to fetch the logs from your container. For example, if you're running Apache uh, on, as a service on your, on your Docker container, you probably want to get the Apache logs. And then probably you want to also monitor the processes that are running on your containers and see data uh, and see details about uh, each process. For example, you want to see the memory, the CPU usage, and things like this of each processes. And then probably you also want to monitor the service that is running on your containers. For example, if you're running an Apache server, you want to um, fetch metrics from the Apache server and see details about it. And all, with all this information, you basically you can have a really good view about what's happening inside your container. But probably you are also interested to see the interaction between your containers and the traffic that is flowing between your Docker containers. Um, so we have all this information uh, that we gather, and uh, today I will concentrate uh, in uh, talking about Elasticsearch as a single way to, s to collect all this kind of operational data uh, in one point, and where, up, where you can use it to search the data that you are interested in across this uh, data that uh, you collected, and also do analytics with them. And if your data, if your number of containers grows, then you don't have to worry about it because Elasticsearch was created from the beginning to grow if your data is, is a distributed search engine. So in this talk, I will concentrate in talking about bits uh, as a way to collect all kinds of operational data and ship it to Elasticsearch. BIT is part of the Elastic stack, which consists of a suite of open source projects like BIT and Logstash on the ingest side, Elasticsearch for storing the data and do analytics there, and Kibana for visualizing the data. So the BIT family consists of um, a few open source projects, and we have a BIT for each data type, we have file bit for collecting the log files. We have metric bit for collecting me metrics periodically from different services. We have packet bit for collecting network data. And we have wheel log bit for collecting Windows event logs. And you can also create your own bit based on the bits platform. And uh, a proof is that are already created over 30 community bits. So let's start with Filebit. So Filebit is like running tail minus F on all your servers, but instead of printing the result on the screen, you send it over the wire to Elasticsearch. And it also comes with some extra powers. For example, it's, uh, it, it has support for multi-line. Think of these um, Java exceptions that are on multiple lines and probably you want to group them together to see it as a single log line. Uh, JSON logs, think of this um, um, application that have support for uh, structure logging that are writing the logs in a JSON format. And filtering, because you don't want to ship all the log lines to Elasticsearch, and maybe you want to ship only a subset of the log lines, uh, and for example, you are not interested in the debug messages, right? Probably you are interested only in the error messages or the warnings. So Filebit sends uh, the log lines as they are, 
without parsing them. Here is an example of um, a log line. So the parsing, if you want to parse your log line, you, can, you need to write your own grog patterns. And there are two ways you can do that. One way is by using the ingest node, which is a plugin for Elasticsearch, and the other option is by using Logstash. And in the second case, you need to, the bid needs to send the data not directly to Elasticsearch, but through Logstash. And here is an example of a grog pattern for those that are not familiar with this. For example, in this case, uh, we have our log line on top, and here you can identify that the first one is um, the IP, and then you have the method, and then you have the URL, and then you have the number of bytes and the duration of the uh, get uh, transaction. After you uh, apply the grog pattern on your log line, you'll probably have the log line parse as in this example. So basically, this is what you will end up having in Elasticsearch. Um, so the most important feature that uh, Filebit has, in my opinion, is that it's, it's, it's capability of handling back pressure. So let's see what back pressure is. So Filebit is a lightweight shipper and is able to, uh, to send the log lines at a maximum speed. But you need to be careful not to overload Logstash. So um, Filebit needs to, have, needs to be able to slow down uh, when it's needed. So the way it works is that Filebit reads a bunch of log lines, uh, then sends them to Logstash, and then waits for the ACK from Logstash and only one receives the ACK, then uh, marks the log lines that is read as acknowledge, and then writes the offset until when it read the log lines in a registry file on disk, and then starts reading the second log line. So what this means is that Filebit is able to adapt this speed automatically depending how fast the next stage can process the data. And if the next stage is down, in this case log stage, then Filebit patiently waits, uh, doesn't read any log lines, it doesn't buffer anything on disk, and doesn't allocate memory, it basically waits. So in this case, the log lines are not lost. Another important feature that, logs, uh, that Filebit has is that it's able to guarantee that each log line was sent at least once. But why at least once and not exactly once? Oh well, because it was theoretically proven that a message is not able to be sent exactly once on a losing network, and this is a, co of a co conclusion of the two Byzantines um, um, generals. So, in a successful case, well, it, the way it happens is that Filebit sends the log lines to Logstash and then waits for the ACK. But in case the Logstash is down in the same time, then Filebit doesn't know at this point if Logstash already processed the log lines or didn't. So it has two options. One option so, will be to, um, to drop the log lines, but this will mean that Filebit is able to guarantee that each log line was sent at most once, which is something that we don't want. No one wants to, look log, to lose log lines. And the second option is to resend the log lines to another log stash instance. But in this case, it might happen that we have duplicates. And the way we are planning to solve this problem uh, in the future is that we are generating a unique ID for each log line, and we do the duplication uh, at the index time in Elasticsearch. This is something that we didn't do yet. 
Okay, let's see how we can use Filebit to collect container logs. And here is a screenshot of Docker login drivers. As you can see, there, is, there are quite a few options, right? And this topic is quite discussed at the moment. And the truth is that all of these options have disadvantages. And that's why uh, I would like to, uh, to show you a few possibilities and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each of it. Oh, so one option, can you hear me? Okay. One option is to use a GAL driver together with Logstash, but in, in this case, um, this solution is not good because it's UDP-based, so you have no delivery guarantee and no congestion control. But the advantage is that the logs are sent directly to Logstash. Another option is to use a JSON file driver from Docker together with Filebit. The advantage is, this, is that this is very easy to set up because the JSON driver is a default driver in, in Docker, so you don't have to configure anything extra. Um, it's easy to add container metadata, like the label of the container, the name of the container, and the Docker logs command works out of the box. But the disadvantage is that some people think that JSON driver uh, when enabled, might slow down your Docker container. So another option is to use the syslog driver together with the syslog server and Filebit. Uh, the advantage of this solution is that you have uh, good control of where your logs are, uh, log files are going, and it also comes with um, uh, the benefit that you get rotation of your log lines for free. But the disadvantage is that you need to manage an extra server, the syslog server. The metadata is serialized, so you have to deserialize it. And multi-line is very difficult to achieve because you get information from different containers mixed. Another option is to use the journal driver together with Filebit. Um, Journal-D, um, this is a uh, is, yeah, uh, the advantage is that it's journal is often available, and you get support for getting the container metadata, like labels and the name of the container. Docker logs works. Um, Docker logs command works. But the disadvantage is that Filebit doesn't have support for journal D yet, but there is a community bit that has support for that. Another option is to use a share volume together with Filebit. So what this means is that you mount um, a directory from your host into your container, and you instruct your application to write the log lines in that share folder. Um, this is easy to set up in case your application is able to rotate your log files, uh, but it's difficult in this case to get the container metadata, like the name of the container and uh, labels of the container. And this, yeah, if you have many containers, might not be such a big issue to see the name of the container. So in conclusion, as you can see, um, all the um, solutions that I presented that have file been involved, are able to guarantee that each log line is sent at least once. Uh, and the other options, they have no guarantees, like, for example, the GAL driver together with Logstash or the FluentD driver together with Logstash. So 
don't write files at all because we don't even have a write on the file system in the container. Yeah, it's up to you. So So basically, the solution, I mean, our main purpose with, with Filebit was to be able to guarantee that each log line was, uh, is sent at least once. Um, yeah, that's that's it's a little bit in between the those uh, versions again, so from my understanding. Is this right? Or um, so it's half guaranteed. If the network or not set is there, then it works. And if it's not okay, then we may have. Uh, yeah, I, I think we can discuss about this uh, use case uh, a bit later and yeah, where you can tell me all the details about your setup. Okay, so um, yeah, so um, yeah, coming a bit back to this one. So here it's um, the solution that uh, is best for you is the one that fits better to your infrastructure. So that's why I presented uh, for each solution the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so you are aware uh, of them before trying them. And then you, yeah, y and then it's up to you to decide which one is best for you. Okay, now let's, uh, let's go forward and speak about MetricBit. So MetricBit is a new bit that it's uh, re released with 5.0. And um, MetricBit has, um, the way MetricBit works is that it fetches periodically metrics from different se uh, services and fetches them to Elasticsearch. And we have support for a few services like the Apache, NGNX, MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres SQL, Redis, Apache Zookeeper. And also you can add here a support for a different service by adding uh, a module in MetricBit. MetricBit comes also with a system module that gives you uh, information uh, about um, system statics information like the CPU, memory, disk I.O., file system, load, network, per course information, per CPU course, per process information. Okay, now let's see how we can use MetricBit to collect container metrics. So there are two options. One option is to be able to get the container, the information from your container by, quer by querying the Docker API. This is um, an easy solution. It's easy to set up. You don't have to do uh, any extra configuration. With this solution, you can get information about um, your metadata. Uh, Docker uh, the, the container metadata, like the labels and the name of the container. Uh, and um, by querying the Docker API, you can get information like the CPU and memory usage, uh, Docker and container information, network, uh, like in and out bytes, uh, dropped packets, disk I.O., reads versus writes, the status of your containers, like how many containers are stopped, how many are running, and things like this. Uh, after uh, I presenting the this slide, I will show you a short demo where you will see uh, in details what kind of information uh, you can get from your Docker container. So Docker module uh, is um, collecting Docker module in MetricBit was just released like five minutes ago uh, with 5.1.1. And uh, it's able to get information about your Docker containers by querying the Docker API. Uh, another uh, way of getting the container information is by reading the C group information directly from slash proc. The advantage of this solution is that it works for all kinds of uh, container technology you are using, not only for Docker. You don't have to use the Docker API, which might uh, bring sometimes, um, might have sometimes some security issues. Uh, but the disadvantage is that you cannot get um, 
container metadata, like labels and the name of the container. You are able to see only the, or you are able to get only the container ID. Um, the second solution um, comes uh, part, part of the system module in, in metric bit. So if you are enabling the C group uh, configuration option, then the process information will be enhanced with um, uh, C group data. So no matter what solution you are using uh, for gathering uh, details about your Docker containers, you'll probably want to run metric bit in a container on your host in order to be able to monitor all the other containers that are running on that host. So an objection that I get when presenting Metribit is that Elasticsearch is not meant to be a time series database. People see uh, Elasticsearch as a search engine, and they think that it's not so efficient for storing numbers. And this is actually not true. Um, Elasticsearch and Lucene, the project on which Elasticsearch is based, did quite uh, big improvements um, and for some time now. And this got even better with Elasticsearch 5.0, where a new um, uh, storing engine was introduced based on BKD trees. So BKD trees was uh, introduced because it has support for uh, multiple dimensions. Think of this geo IP point where you have a longitude and a latitude. But this proved to be uh, efficient also for one dimension values, and those are numbers, right? So in the end, um, it's with this, with BKD trees, it's faster to index, it's faster to query, it's more disk efficient, and has it's more memory efficient. And here you have some, some graphs uh, to show you the difference. So another disadvantage that Elasticsearch had before uh, 5.0 release was that it was not able to compress the flow values. So all the flow, uh, flow value was, was always represented at four bytes, on four bytes. So there are quite many compression algorithms. Think of this gorilla paper from Facebook that describes, uh, that describes a few of them. Uh, but they cannot be applied uh, on, um, on for Elasticsearch because of the way Lucene is storing the data. So as a workaround for Elasticsearch 5.0, there were two new uh, float uh, values types introduced. One of them is half flows. That means that you store a flow value always on two bytes. And this has good precision for small values, but the precision degradates with the bigger the number is. The second type is scale floats. What this means is that you store a flow value as an integer with a scaling factor. So for example, if you have a scaling factor of 100, you multiply 100 with your value, with your flow value, and then the result, you store it as an integer in Elasticsearch. And when you query Elasticsearch, you divide it by 100, and this is your flow value. And this is very useful, for example, when you need to store um, like percentages, for example, think of the CPU usage. Yeah. And here are a few uh, graphs that show you the difference. So why Elasticsearch for time series? Because it comes with horizontal scalability. It has a mature support for clustering. It comes with uh, flexible it has support for flexible aggregations, including moving averages and whole winters that are used for anomaly detection. And the most important thing, in, in my opinion, is that you can use a single system to also store logs and also metrics. And also comes with uh, great UIs like Timeline UR or Grafana. And in general, uh, it comes with a great ecosystem 
think of this um, uh, alerting tools or reporting tools. Now let's see um, Packetbit. So the way Packetbit works is that install as an agent on your servers, is listening on the traffic, and then decodes uh, the upper layer protocols uh, and correlates the request as a response into transaction that are pushed to Elasticsearch. So from the decoders that support, we can note HTTP, MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres SQL, DNS, Redis, Memcache, Cassandra, and so on. And also you can add here your own decoder by adding a module in Packetbit. And for example, if uh, the traffic that is exchanged between your services or between your containers is unknown, meaning that there is no decoder for that, you can still see a few details about your, uh, about your um, uh, traffic. And the same case applies if the traffic is encrypted. And this, um, these details, we, we call them flows. Um, and with flows, you can get a few details like the number of packets, the number of bytes exchange, uh, the transmissions, and things like this. I will show you in a second uh, during the demo. So with Packetbit, you can monitor the traffic exchange between your Docker containers. All you have to do is to install Packetbit in a container on your host, and you'll be able to monitor the traffic exchange between the containers that are running on that host. Now let me show you a quick demo. So um, I have a Ubuntu machine on my Mac uh, that is running Filebit, uh, Packetbit, and Metricbit. Uh, I install them, so I, it's very easy to install them. You just have to go to the download page or uh, of of the bits, and then you you, you grab the the package that you are interested. For example, I have an Ubuntu, so I got the Debian package, and you install it. Um, and then uh, I want to run a container. I'm running on a container that is running the Redis inside. Uh, as you can see here, this is a command that I'm using. And uh, as you can see here, I want to show you that I'm passing some labels uh, and with the idea that uh, I want to show you later that you are able to monitor or to see the, the label that I'm passing here uh, in, uh, in Elasticsearch. Okay, so I'm running this Redis container. Uh, and now, let me show. And now, le let's suppose we want to um, um, to monitor to to get the logs from our Redis container and visualize them in, in Kibana. So for that, we just have to configure a file bit. Uh, so by default, the, the Docker container has enabled. Um, the JSON driver. So that means uh, that we'll dump uh, the log lines in a JSON format in that specific uh, directory. So in Filebit, I just need to uh, configure a prospector with a path to that uh, directory where the Docker dumps uh, the log lines. Um, and Basically, um, yeah, that's it. And then, yeah, here I also have configured to send the, 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 the data to Elasticsearch directly. Okay, and after I, I start a uh, file bit, then it will start uh, sending the log lines without parsing them, right, to, um, uh, to Elasticsearch in a special end index pattern. Uh, so, Let's go to the management and see the index pattern. So I have the file bit index pattern where I store all these uh, log lines. So let's go to the discovery page, select the file bit index pattern, 
And now let's generate a bit of traffic. I think easier will be to restart our um, Docker container with Redis. So in the meantime, what I'm showing here, it's uh, the 5.1.1 version that we just released like five minutes ago. So hopefully it works. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, I see the log lines. Uh, and what I want to show here is that you can see basically um, the, the entire JSON, the entire log that is in a JSON format uh, that Docker writes. And here as well, you can see uh, the name from where, uh, the name of the log file that contained that log, uh, log line and the offset. Okay, uh, so now let's, um, if we want to also see, um, to monitor, if we want to monitor uh, our ready server, service uh, inside the container and also the Docker container. Uh, let's configure metric bit for that. So as you can see here in metric bit, I have configured the system module that gives you information about the CPU, the load, file system, uh, memory network, and so on. You can configure how often uh, to um, how often to um, to monitor uh, um, the system statistics, how often to get the system statistics, and for which processes, in this case, for all the processes. In addition, uh, I also um, configure here the Redis module in order to g fetch information from the Redis servers. And here I specify what kind of information I want to get from the Redis servers and how often to get this information. And of course, the, the Redis uh, host. Another module that I configure in, in metric bit is a Docker module in order to get stat um, details about the Docker container. And for this, um, so this is using the Docker API, is querying the Docker API in order to get this information. As you can see, there are quite many uh, information that we can uh, query, that we can get. And uh, here you can also specify how often to get this information, the host, uh, and yeah. So basically, that's it. So now if we start metric bit, it will start sending uh, metrics to a special index pattern in uh, Elasticsearch. So, and that index pattern is metric bit. As you can see, we get quite a lot of information. Now let's um, filter, for example, for the Docker-related metrics. As you can see, we also have quite many. And if I click on one here, I get information uh, like the memory usage of, uh, of, of the service that is running on a Docker container. Um, so let's drill down. And for example, I want to also see the CPU usage. And here, I see the CPU usage in kernel space and so on. It's what is interesting is that uh, for each metric uh, in metric bit, you can, you can also have this round trip time. So how long it took um, to, is it better like this? Yes. Sorry. Uh, so how long it, um, it took to, uh, to get a, a response back? for that specific metric, right? Uh, also, I would like to show you that you get information about your, um, about all the containers that are running on your host. Let me try to do this a bit bigger. So for example, here I can see how many uh, containers are running. In my case, it's just one. Uh, how many containers are stopped, how many containers are, are in total, and uh, things like this. 
Now let me also show you the container information. So I can see, uh, yeah, details about um, my container. What I want to uh, highlight here is that you can also see the labels uh, that I passed when I started the Docker container. And I see that uh, my container is uh, up for four minutes. Okay, now let's see also uh, information that we get from the Redis service. And as you can see, we get quite a lot of information um, about the Redis service. Uh, so I, I won't go through all of this, right? Okay. Um, Also, system statistics. Quickly, I would like to show you that, for example, here um, we can see for each process information uh, about this uh, process count, uh, counts daemon. Uh, so we can see the state of the container, how much memory consumed, CPU, the command line that was used to start the process, things like this. Now, uh, let's go to, um, uh, to see how we can see uh, the traffic that is exchanged between our uh, Docker con Yeah, we have only one Docker container, but you can imagine, yeah, if I have more containers, then we'll be able to see the traffic that is exchanged between them. So for that, let's configure PacketBit. And here in PacketBit, the most important configuration option is the interface on which to listen uh, for the traffic. So by default, it's any on, uh, on Linux. So we don't have to configure anything. And then for each protocol that supports, you can configure the port where to listen for that specific traffic. So we leave everything by default. So and if we start PacketBit, then we'll be able to then PacketBit sends uh, all the information about the traffic to Elasticsearch in a special end index, so PacketBit. Let's configure PacketBit and yeah, and then uh, here we'll be able to see all the traffic. So let's generate some traffic. So by um, yeah, generating a, a Redis command. As you can see, um, this is the info. Let me to quickly look. Another info. Another info. So let's filter. Uh, um, set, I think I did. Okay, and now as you can see, the time it's uh, yeah, like one minute ago, when we run the command, we are able to see the set command that I just run in uh, on on the Ubuntu machine that I have. So I can see the command, the port, the query, the return value. Um, yeah. Things like this. So, just uh, as an idea for you to to see um, that I, we can also uh, see uh, in real time the traffic exchange between our services. Okay. Now ev each bit is coming with a set of dashboards um, because yeah, this is the discovery page is nice, but sometimes you want to see. Uh, or people prefer to see a chart or a graph. Uh, it's, uh, it's easier for, for you to have the big picture. So each bit is coming with, like I said, uh, each bit is coming with a set of dashboards. Uh, and let me quickly show you. So for example, this one is um, a dashboard that we created to show you the CPU usage. Um, and you can see here, uh, we see the CPU usage uh, per uh, system, user space, system load, uh, things like this. 
And um, what's nice here, you can also see basically what you can see with the talk command by running the talk command in, on the Linux systems. So basically, the top host, uh, not the top host, let me show you the processes. So basically, here you can see the top processes um, uh, sorted by memory usage or by CPU usage that are running on, um, on, my, on my container or on all, the, yeah, on, all the, on all the containers in this case. Um, so you can see here I have CPU usage per process, CPU memory usage per process. Um, now let me show you another interesting dashboard on oh, the Docker containers. Um, so here I have two Docker containers that are running and you can see one is running and 41 are stopped. Um, and yeah, and you can see some interesting graphs how the CPU usage evolves over time and things like this. Uh, and of course, these dashboards are just a, a as a starting point for your own dashboard. So you can use this um, to uh, customize uh, or create in addition other dashboards that suit uh, your your needs. Yeah, so that's it uh, from, from my side, from the demo. Now, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask me. Or Stefan, he is uh, my colleague from the BITS team. Uh, so we are available here for you to help to answer all your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, uh, Vladimir Home 24 uh, Question is, where do I run all those bits? So on each host machine in Sorry, Docker Fleet. Excuse me, where do I run? Where do I run bits? Yeah, ah, okay. the software. Is it running on each host machine or uh, how does it work actually? So it works probably query in Docker API, but where should I run this software? So uh, you, there are two options. One option is to run it on the host. So for example, if you, if you want to monitor your Docker containers, you can run it at, on the host uh, and in order to monitor the containers. Or a better option is to run it uh, in a separate container uh, on the host. So uh, if we go, um, I have in the presentation a picture. So uh, I have a picture for packet bit, I think, but it's um, it's the same for all the bits, right? So you you run it in a co in a separate container, and it monitors all the other containers that are running on on that host. So basically, you install a bit on each host. Yeah. Yep. Uh, where, do we uh, where do we have these uh, YAML files you used for? So the these YAML files uh, are the, the configuration. configuration. They are for the packet bit, right? So you have to have to have the you have to know which container runs on which host, so that you have the right YAML file on the right host. I mean, if you have a YAML file with the Redis configuration for the beat, then you have to know on which host the Redis will run. But uh, yes, yes, so it doesn't do... You don't know where you... So I think the question... So I think your question is uh, that you need to uh, manually configure uh, the beat. Uh, it doesn't do auto-discovery. I think this is your question. Basically, so the bits at the moment they don't do any auto discovery in the sense that you need to specify in the case of metric bit, for example. In the case of metric bit, you need to specify from uh, where the Redis server is, is available. In the case of packet bit, um, 
you basically it's a, a bit different story because you kind of listen for the traffic on that port. Um, but in the future, we are planning to um, um, to um, add support in the bits to do auto discovery by default. So you don't have to um, do manual configuration. So I hope I answered your question. I have another question. So in the continue to the one of the previous questions. So uh, do you know what's uh, like over uh, head cost of running those, for example, metric bits uh, and for, for specific, uh, how, how much CPU like will be consumed only just for monitoring and serving all those like bits, let's say. Yeah. Do, 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 do you have such like estimation numbers? Yeah. So I think the the question is if I know if I ha yeah if I know how much uh, the bit consumes uh, on um, yeah so um, we don't have any official numbers to share with you we did some uh, some tests a while ago when we had only packet bit and it was five percent CPU so it's consuming five percent uh, of the CPU usage on that box um, thinking uh, so it's like I said, it's a lightweight shipper. So it's written in Go, so all the bits are written in Golang. Uh, so they are very light, so the idea is that they are not consuming a lot of um, resources. Um, and as you install it on the same box of with your um, active services, right? Maybe, uh, maybe? Um, maybe just to add to the picture, it depends on what kind of data you're going to monitor. If you're using just metric bit, yeah, we pull your service every 10 seconds, for example, if you configure it every 10 seconds. It's not much. It's just pull, JSON, push. Um, if you do packet bit, it kind of depends on how much traffic you have in your network. The more traffic you have, the more we have to analyze. The more traffic you have, the more you have to analyze. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the same for Firebeat. If you just have a log line every 10 minutes, Firebeat is basically idle. If you send 100k log lines per second, well, Firebeat has to read and process them and has to send to your log stash or whatever. It always depends on how much traffic you generate. Um, yeah. So Telenox, you said uh, if you generate big file, it processes and sends it. But is there any comparison with already existing solution? Asking because, for example, we are using FluentD or TD Agent, whatever. And sometimes uh, when we have huge load, it's just, well, when we generate a lot of files, it just goes crazy and it's like 30% of CPU. Well, I do understand the reason why it does, but do you have any comparison to the competitors of FileBit? No, we don't. We don't. Uh, we don't have any comparison with other uh, competitors. At least not officially. We we have some internally some uh, um, benchmark that we run, but not to share with with uh, with the community. Um, it depends from the from the bit to, to bit, as as uh, as uh, Stefan was saying. So you are referring specifically to file bit or There is nothing to share for... Yeah. Okay. So again, it depends. Like, like you're asking us questions, which are kind of hard to um, answer, because you have to profile yourself. Or you have to benchmark yourself, your infrastructure, and your, um, how everything is supposed to work. Um, we do not know which kind of CPU you have. We do not know how much memory you have. So we have a hard time to tell you, OK, it will take 5%. Um, but Firebeat um, having back pressure, like if Logstash cannot process as many lines, Firebeat will still slow down. So this uh, has an impact on your resource usage. You can um, use GoMaxProx, it's also a config, option, uh, config file option, 
to say, okay, use at most one CPU. You can use Tasket and other tools, um, and you're supposed to actually. It's a monitoring, and um, sure, monitoring might be important or is important, but your application making money for you is more important. That is, use whatever tool you have, like C groups, task set, to ensure any tool you have, Fluent D, Log, Stash, Five, whatever, is in limits. logs per second, whatever, and then using different tools to sh just read those logs and to ship it to whatever. So we can just read logs using, using Fluent D, ship it to uh, Logstash, we can use Filebits, ship it to Logstash, and I was asking exactly uh, for the same amount of data on the same host, uh, do you have any comparison on CPU usage of tools? No. Okay, thanks. question especially on filebeats. Um, you said uh, filebeats will recognize when uh, Logstash has a high load and then uh, pause a little bit. So is there an option to, let's say, kind of uh, dynamic uh, filtering? For example, normally he sends also debug logs and on high load when he sees a god uh, that Logstash cannot handle go down to info level, for example, or something like this? Yeah, we don't have something like this to, uh, yeah, on in real time to adjust uh, what kind of filtering you are to do. We have only, uh, yeah, uh, a static filtering, let's say like this, where you can specify from the from the beginning what which lines you are interested in and which ones are, are not interesting. Maybe a new feature idea. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a new feature request. <laughs> um, what would be a suitable way to access the metrics from metrics beam beat if we, for example, want to use them in a CI server, so get actually knowledge back um, according to a job rerun, how the stage performed, or is there an API or interface? No. no. So the, our, our idea was to push them to Elasticsearch. So we have a few outputs uh, where you can send the, the, the metrics. One of them is uh, Elasticsearch, one of them is, Log is Logstash, and they also have support for a few que queuing systems. Like Kafka, like Kafka and Redis. And also, you are also able to dump them in a file. No, we don't have any. Yeah, we don't have. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, oh, you. How does um, Kibana compare to Grafana? And I mean, you didn't show the, um, the dashboard editing UI, so I assume it's some sort of uh, Elasticsearch query underneath. Yes, so that's a good question. Um, it depends on the bit and the data that you want to visualize. Uh, so for example, for packet bit and file bit, uh, and um, winlog bit we have, I didn't present it, but WinLogbit uh, collects Windows uh, event logs. Uh, you, you are, it's easier to um, to uh, show that, to visualize the data of Kibana. With metrics, it's a, a bit di a different story because Kibana is not specialized uh, for visualizing the metrics, and it doesn't have support, for example, for derivative, which is uh, something that you usually want to visualize. Uh, so for that, we have uh, also uh, started timeline, which is a plugin for uh, um, for uh, Kibana. And we are in the process of working on a, a different plugin that is specialized for metrics. Um, so uh, um, it's Grafana is specialized for, for metrics. And uh, Kibana is a bit more general.
Okay, I so hope I answer your question. In the end, um, in a production use case, you still need to deploy Grafana <laughs> to, to have a sensible and like more fancy UI for your metrics. So at this moment, yes. Uh, like I said, we have Timeline that has limited functionality. So Timeline needs a plugin in Kibana. So if I, so basically you'll be able to see uh, or to, um, so with Timeline you can do, lim you have um, limited uh, support in visualizing metrics. So for example, you have derivative. Um, so you are able to visualize um, uh, metrics in the same um, place with logs, for example, using Kibana. Um, but for more advanced um, uh, metric support, we don't have anything yet, but we are working on another plugin uh, for Kibana that is specialized for doing more advanced uh, things with metrics, which is uh, an alternative to Grafana. Because I think, in my opinion, it will be really a pity to be able to, or to be forced to use two different UIs for the two different data types. So that's why, yeah. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, so um, if you guys don't have any questions, you can, and if you have another question, don't free to uh, hesitate to contact me or Stefan afterwards. You will stay for drinks as well, for, for food as well. So um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>